Today's program is part of a new series that Northeastern has launched. Uh, we kicked off the speaker series in September here it's called Local Leaders Global Impact, um, where we find someone in the community, a local leader who has really had a global impact, and pair them with one of our faculty out of the Boston campus to have a dialogue about things that have worked on a local level, on a global level, lessons learned, um, and really get into some thoughtful conversation about what can we learn from each other um, in carrying the city forward. So I am pleased today um, to announce that we have uh, two local leaders with Global Impact um, joining us. First, let me introduce Dan Gregory. Um, Dan Gregory just literally landed a few um, hours ago from Boston. Uh, leads our Idea Center, which is a venture accelerator program out of the DeMore McKim uh, College of Business. And also, that's our student-run program, and then also uh, co-leads our Center for Entrepreneurship Education and is on faculty. So um, uh, Dan also um, has had an extensive tenure in the digital media space, and so we'll bring some of his perspective on um, technology infusion in the, the entrepreneurship space. And I think everyone in the room knows Dave Jones. Um, if you don't, you probably have not been reading a lot of articles uh, in our local paper for the last couple of years. Um, CEO and president of Peak 10 Managed Data Services. Um, Charlotte Business Person of the Year in 2010, um, avid runner, overall great guy, um, and um, I think one of those people that the Charlotte community looks to when we think of somebody who took an, an idea, uh, put all of the right ingredients together and made it successful. And I, I told Cheryl not to talk to my mother, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll be <laughs> Long time. And then um, I think all of you know Eric uh, via the newspaper um, photos that he has out there uh, with the Charlotte Business Journal, Eric Spanberg, who has agreed to serve as our moderator for this series. So I am not going to take any more time other than to turn it over to Eric and say thanks to both Dan and Dave. Appreciate pleasure, pleasure. It's nice to be here. Great. Well, thank, thank you everybody for coming. And Thanks to our panelists. Uh, this is a perfect topic. Somebody was already making jokes about the presidential debates. Uh, but it being campaign season, uh, obviously there's so much talk about rebuilding economies and jobs. And inevitably, you hear candidates and everyone else talking about entrepreneurs. How do we create jobs? And these two gentlemen are going to talk to us a little bit about that. They don't have to necessarily take a partisan stand, <laughs> but they can give Sounds us some good like information. Heat, I've already voted. So I'm <laughs> there okay. you go. Dave's the first name. President, and I'm the, uh, I'm the candidate, right? I mean, the, uh, the aspirant. So everybody will, will be nice, unlike in the debates, and we'll see what we can uh, come up with here. Uh, so I'm going to start out um, asking these guys some questions, and then after we have a little bit of conversation, hopefully y'all will ask some questions, which will be better than mine. I know they will. Um, but we're going to start with David, and uh, since you have built this data center business, uh, it's grown even during the recession. Um, maybe you can just start by talking a little bit about what inspired you and helped you as you built this business, particularly as you went through difficult economic times. Well, I, I guess, you know, the inspiration, I always make a joke of that and said I didn't have a job, so I had to do something. <laughs> but, um, Early on, back in 99, 2000, I was uh, in a consulting practice and I was helping companies. It was really marketing and management, um, but my background had been in telephony, so I understood networks, I understood the technology that was emerging. And what I believed from having been in a startup uh, long distance company back in those days and served a very similar market, I believed that businesses would care where their critical infrastructure was, that, I, that we were just getting started. And I was helping them build a, an internet plan, which they had no clue exactly what they were doing. I had probably less clue, but I understood the concepts and how to put it together and help them with the network side of things and um, not really on the application. We still stay that way. We're very infrastructure focused as a company. And my CFO affectionately says the only thing I got right in the financial plan was that it was a local business. So, <laughs> but it's very. It from day one. <laughs> yeah. So to me, um, and we built this company on relationship, on building the right relationships internally and externally, and th that's what I understood. And as we started out, this this sounds a little like uh, kind of rather trite, but what I wanted to do was. Um, 
to build a company that was based on certain uh, a certain vision I had, but also created an environment that I could develop people. And not that I knew that I could do it, mm -hmm. but my experience, past experience, said that I could put teams together that could work together. And um, frankly, I had been in a consulting practice for about two years, and I, I was an operator, and I knew that's what I needed to do. And there were several people, some mentors at that point in time, and they said, you know, uh, in fact, I, I gave a, I was on a panel um, with Shape Charlotte, which is a great emerging group of young people who, young and old people who are trying to figure out what they want to do with themselves in terms of, and I said, you know, what I realized was I had been in a consulting practice. I had never been in an environment where I had to eat what I killed. And it's a little bit rough to say that, but that's really what it boiled down to. And I said, you know, I'm going to do this. And if I fail, I know that I can go back and I can do these other things and I can survive. And you have to realize, you have to take that leap. So the inspiration for me was, this is really where my passion is. And if for some reason I really screw this up, <laughs> I, I still have something I can go back to and start over. So I had never done that before. And my, my career had been with GTE, which was a big telephone utility, Virginia State Corporation Commission, which is, you know, government, and then um, went into a startup long distance business, ended up at MCI, large, large bureaucratic business that I hated, and then it realized that I really needed to be doing something on my own. It's a so, long story, but I'm sorry. And so as you got into this, you clearly wanted to make that leap, but can you talk a little bit about the leap of faith that goes with that in terms of, you know, all the worries and headaches uh, that are the price of admission, so to speak, of running your own show? Well, you know, when I was uh, first year at the University of Virginia, second year, I, I went through Hell Week, and I tried to forget all that. <laughs> and it's it's, it's kind of, in a way, it's, it's a little similar, but um, you really, you know, for me, I really believed that we could be successful at, at this, and that was the, the drive for me. And yeah, there were times when I wasn't sure we'd make payroll. There were times when my CFO and I looked at each other and said, you know, we got more money in our own bank account than we have in this business. But um, ultimately, what gave us hope was we realized with this business, it's very has a very high capital intensity. I mean, every data center back then we built was three and a half to four million dollars. And I said, you know, that's a lot of money. Today, it's twice that to build a data center. So early on, um, as this industry was emerging, um, the private equity firms and investment banking firms, they clamored because they saw that we were going into markets that no one else was penetrating. Mm -hmm. And um, that encouraged me um, enough to take the money when we got the money in 2000. The funny thing was in 2001, we raised $18.5 million at a time that the dot-com bubble had burst and no one was investing. In fact, there was another group that invested in us and he's sitting right there. Gene, Gene Bodicott, who, if it hadn't been for him, we probably wouldn't be where we are in Charlotte today because he took a, he took a, a ticket on us. He just said, I, I believe these guys. And today, what, Gene, we probably lease 80, close to 80,000 square feet out there. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, one of those things that he, I guess he realized that we were, we had a passion for what we were doing. Uh, we weren't, um, we weren't jumping off the deep end with things. We we're very conservative in how we, how we went about the business. But, um, that was enough to get us started, and we were scared to death. Yeah, we were. So. And it, Dan, I'm sure you've heard from people who've started businesses or want to start businesses similar sentiments about the fear, the trepidation. Uh, but I'm curious what the prevailing sentiment is right now, given that the economy is so much more difficult, access to capital, we hear that phrase all the time. So what kinds of things are you hearing from entrepreneurs and prospective entrepreneurs? Well, so I, I deal with younger entrepreneurs, um, uh, not, not, <laughs> not about two years I, younger. younger. <laughs> uh, 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 not younger than Dave, but younger in their age um, than um, <laughs> relative to others. Um, and uh, and so some of them are students, uh, others of them are, are young alums. And and this leap of faith, which um, I can remember taking as a young person when I went from a large corporation to a small corporation, isn't an option. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a survival skill um, mm -hmm. that 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 young people have to have today. Um, um, so um, we use Northeastern. We use the. Um, 
relatively safe um, confines of a university to provide um, the kind of structure um, that a, an emerging venture and an emerging entrepreneur needs. Um, and, um, and so um, we tend to see ventures that are not hugely capital intensive, although we have a lab to venture program where um, a lot of biotech companies come through IDEA. Um, and those are extremely capital intensive. Um, but we see, particularly in, in the digital media area, very low, um, cap they're, they're referred to as capital efficient uh, ventures. Um, uh, uh, and so the challenge is not so much access to capital, but differentiation in the market. Um, it's, the challenge is, is um, taking entrepreneurs who are all passionate about the product or service that they're developing um, and get them to understand that they're about to collide with something called the market, um, in which there are equally smart people with virtually identical products and services. Um, so we spend a lot of time um, taking these very literate, uh, technology literate uh, uh, young people um, and helping them understand uh, what it takes to, to get into that marketplace to differentiate yourself um, uh, and, uh, and to stand out in the crowd. When I was a, uh, um, in the 80s, I worked for um, a very large direct marketing company that used to compile the yellow pages um, and they would, they would had, they had an internal group of people. They got every yellow page from around the country and they raced uh, in a manual process to get it um, online and mailed to these small businesses was the target market. And, and literally it was a, a room half the size of this floor filled with people transcribing. Uh, there were no scanners, et cetera. This is the 80s. Um, now, if you don't know search engine optimization um, um, as, a, as an emerging venture, so that you, you, um, it's, a, it's a worldwide market for anything, um, uh, and, and if you can't kind of rise to the top um, uh, and differentiate your product and be a player in the market, you're, you're lost. Um, so, so, but getting back to your original question, the plunge, uh, which is so exciting, and particularly when it works out well, um, uh, um, is something that we're seeing uh, as a, an essential life skill for, for young people today. You know, to, to that plunge and successful and that was one of the things that, again, go back to that Shape Charlotte group, I said, you, know, you guys realize when you if you start your own business, you never fail. That's right. You, you may not make it. Right. No, I, if you to I totally you, get it. Yeah. 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 All, that was another reason I think we were successful as my partner and I both had been successful, but we'd also fail. Right. And we'd said, well, right. dust myself off. Right. And go back. Yeah. yeah I, and in fact, I was, that's where I was going next is I was hoping both of you could talk a little bit about uh, you always hear how important failure is uh, in terms of learning and very few people step out and do everything correctly the first time. So uh, whether you call it failure or successful failure, can you just talk a little bit about the importance of that in terms of figuring out where you're going as an entrepreneur? Have you ever failed anything? <laughs> yeah, I failed a few things. Um, yeah, where I failed wasn't that I didn't deliver results. Where I failed was um, in a relate, under, not understanding the relationship between um, the, the guy I reported to, basically the chairman of the company, and myself. And there were some issues that I was uncomfortable with that I let interfere with the relationship with him. And what I, people that have heard me talk, know that one of the most important things that I've learned is managing up. And mm -hmm. I can translate that now into so many things that, and even to a young entrepreneur to realize you always have a boss. Yep. You always have someone yes. you're working for. And if you don't understand that. the pressures they have, you will never be successful. And even if you don't like them, mm -hmm. that's where you are. You know, wherever you go, that's where you are. And you have to be able to boil that down. It's hard. It's really hard. I didn't get it. I let a personal feeling and a fear, and I, you know, one of us was going to leave, and he was the chairman. So, uh, <laughs> but, <Who left? laughs> but even today, um, as I look at the board that I report to, um, I make it a point because I know in a private equity firms, every Monday they have a portfolio meeting. Mm -hmm. So every Friday or on the weekend, I message my chairman, and I said, "Is there anything you need to know?" 
he's used to that now. At first, he said, why are you asking me that? And I said, because I know you got a meeting Monday or Tuesday, and you're going to get asked questions because you went and spent too much money for this company, <laughs> and they're going to want to know how's it going. And I'm, I'm here to give you whatever information you need. <clears throat> Probably to them, it was one of the most important things that I did. To me, that's a survival instinct mm -hmm. because I, I realized about eight months after I got through the anguish of why did this happen to me, and I was, I was pretty depressed, I will tell you. Um, but I, I came through that and I said, you know, this really wasn't his fault, it was my fault. Right, right. And once I got there, it really changed the whole dynamic. And ever since when we started the company, I've always followed, I may not agree, but I have to step back and say, you know, I work for those guys, right. ultimately. Right. And, and I use that, I mean, to take it even further, I, that's a message I deliver inside the company. And I'll tell <clears throat> the lowest paid employee that you have an obligation to manage up. And I'll tell that manager, it's not about just managing those 15 people that work for you. If you're not managing up, then that tells me something. Number one, it tells me the wrong place, but number two, it tells me this has, how it translates to me. You don't understand the vision of the company. And so that's, that's really, it was a huge, a huge traumatic lesson for me because I ended up having to move totally um, from Alabama, which may not be so bad, but <laughs> <laughs> Alabama to Georgia and, well, and ultimately <laughs> to, uh, and ultimately North Carolina as a result. But, you know, where we are today, as I look back, a number of the people I worked with back then, have, have a, it's very flattering. They says, we, we always knew that if you ever started your own company, it would be an awesome place to work. So that's a huge, huge compliment. So, Dan, I'm sure now when you deal with people that are almost as young as David, <laughs> it might be hard to convince them of the importance of the lesson that he just outlined. No, it's, it's, it's actually very easy. Um, and, and uh, um, you know, we, we have... Um, these ventures that are, are hard at work at technologies, mm -hmm. and we focus them on the fact that it's, it's that's, again, it's a little bit like the product market mm -hmm. dichotomy that I talked about. Um, the, the, the product is, is kind of the easy part. The technology is the easy part. The buzzwords mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. around technology, is, that's, that's trivial, because there's always gonna be someone that understands that mm -hmm. um, and can put it together. But it's the interrelationship of people um, yeah. in these in these companies that make a huge difference. And the way that we deal with failure, I personally preach life cycle. And uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that absolutely everything has a life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, you know things start slowly and, and haltingly, and then they accelerate, and then they level off. And, and uh, the 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 trick to sustaining any business is figuring out the innovation as the growth phase moves into a kind of a flattening and to create a new um, uh, growth phase. And ideas have life cycles, products have life cycles, industry has life cycles, companies have life, life cycles. And so if you, if you focus it on that, people say, okay, this idea that I have has a life cycle. And, and it's, it, if it doesn't start to accelerate like that, it's, it, you gotta tweak it. You, gotta, you, you have all of, it's sort of a, a dashboard um, that you have in front of you. And, and if you can't, if you can't um, get it to move up, then you gotta iterate and come back and, and start, uh, start again. Um, and people, people, and with friends and family investing, it's, it's, it's critical. But um, you know, you you you, you it, it's a different kind of a relationship than a professional investor. But people have to get used to the idea that people um, that that the money that is coming in is risk capital. There's a good investor behind it is going to assess the risk of this venture, and they're going to make their own judgment. And as long as you're an honest person um, and express what you're what you're trying to do and where you are in that work, that if things don't work out. Um, you know, there's going to be some unhappiness, certainly, um, but but that's the game that both 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 uh, uh, players are in. So we try to we try to rationalize this failure so it moves away from you know the horror um, that we all feel as entrepreneurs. And I spent you know 25 years starting companies and before I got into academia, and so I know the sickness that you feel in making a payroll and, um, and the drain on cash and the investors that aren't committing and all of that. I mean, it's, it's really <coughs> scary, but 
Uh, we get them young, and we get them as part of an educational program. We have a, something called the Center for Entrepreneurship Education that actually integrates classroom and experiential learning together. Mm -hmm. So IDEA is kind of this big lab where people can bring their ventures. And then we have a set of classrooms, a, cl a class programming that are geared to undergraduate, graduate, faculty, and alumni. And they can come through. Not all of the pieces are built yet. Um, but the, the idea is that there's a system of entrepreneurship. I, we, we, I, we were talking about your real estate business, and I was struck. Um, uh, for, um, I can't read from this distance, and my memory for names, of course, so I apologize. It's the but, same as yours. But, excuse me? It's the same as yours. There you go. Oh, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> but thank you for the hint. <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about Dan, yes. that Dan. Yeah. No, but there's a, 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 a system for learning. Uh, while you're still relatively young and in the relative safety of uh, university or the early stages of your career. Um, and th this is the time, that's the age at which to really learn, you know, for, for people to learn through experience but then learn, um, you know, through classroom uh, that, um, that um, they will survive a failure um, is the bottom line. Uh, David, you were, you were nodding your head when he mentioned the family <coughs> piece and that dynamic often figures into startups. Talk a little bit about that. Well, there are two things that, <clears throat> that Dan brought up that I, that I had to smile about. One was that because when we started out, it was a lot of friends and family. We raised about, um, in two rounds in 2000, we raised a little under six million dollars. I understand that was enough for us to start building two data centers and that one was in Jacksonville and the other one was here. Um, and some of those investors, when we talked to them, I said, if you can't, the old message, if you can't throw that check in the trash can, don't give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the risk you're taking. Right. And then I did have some family investors as well. As well. Fortunately, right now, they're distant family because they, they were never happy uh, that they expected never to see a failure. And yeah. our investors stayed in for 10 years. Right. And so there are a lot of my private equity investor stayed for 10 years. So a lot of, of, uh, of the others said, the smart ones said, write it off. You know? So when they finally got paid out when we sold in 2010, there were some happy people. Of course, some of them I said, where do you want me? You don't want me to send this to your wife, do you? <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. But anyway, it, it does, for us, we had 60 investors initially. And it was, um, it always bothered me because I felt like how much can I tell them? How much can I not tell them? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to where we are today with, one, with my private equity investors, it was always, whatever you want to know, I'll tell you, because we, that was the managing upside of it. They couldn't have no surprises. Right. The other thing you said, which I, I really related to when you said there were, there were cycles, I have a different term for that. What we see, have seen in our company is brick walls, <laughs> where we got to a point where we said, oh crap, we're gonna hit the wall. So we had to change. In right. fact, we're on the third dramatic um, change of that right now and looking at our back office systems and realizing that we have run so hard that we had this provisioning system that rather than stepping back and say, we need to replace the whole system, we said, okay, we'll add this to it, we'll add this to it. And we suddenly realized that it's way too manual. And my concern was, we're hurting our customers by right. doing this. So it was always that piece but that's also what makes it very hard for an entrepreneur because as you hit those cycles or those walls, the guy who started the business can't always adapt right. to the, thing, the next phase of growth for the company. Right. I, I compliment myself in a way because I've been able to do that in our company, but it's, I guess, because I never really said, you know, it'll always be this way. Right. I've always had to say, how do we make it better? And that's, it's uh, it's a wonderful feeling to avoid that brick wall. Uh, <laughs> Better than yeah. the alternative, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 that it's 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 true innovation. You know, you think of the innovation yeah. as the original idea, but innovation happens constantly yeah. through the life of a company, yeah. and, and you always have to be on your toes for it. Yeah. And when you when you see it and you respond to it and you're successful, it's it's incredibly satisfying. Yeah. Well, one thing I wondered about Sorry. you mentioned earlier was there will always be somebody that can navigate. Uh, what's going on, such as the digital media, which I know you've dealt with a little bit. But at the same time, I, I would like to hear some of your thoughts because I think any of us that go to a lot of business panel discussions, uh, you know, digital media, social media, Facebook, Twitter, all these things are just sort of thrown out 
but there are very rarely any kind of specifics yeah. or strategy or detail to them. And I'm just wondering, how often do you think people are falling prey to just following the herd rather than having a distinct strategy when you get into that realm? I, I can tell you my thoughts on it. That, you know, I've seen in our business, we've seen a lot of um, influences come in from digital, different, different sets of digital media, media and different ways things, uh, communication. I look at it as communication mm -hmm. is how do you improve that. But what the impact of that to me internally, first off, is making sure that, that we use digital media in a way that presents the right image and message for the company. Mm -hmm. So it's about the company first from my perspective and how we deploy that. And we use Facebook and Twitter and a bunch of other things, but it's, it's very controlled in a way because my customers tend to be, they don't want necessarily people to know where they are. Mm -hmm. We have things called cybersecurity and all those sorts of things <laughs> that can play into that. And, um, but to me, the more important thing with that is making sure, what happened, what has happened if you look at it is so often the mistakes people are making is they're not thinking. Right. You know, they respond, and I'm, I'm probably one of the worst when it comes to email. I, I, I get an email, and I'm, I'm out of passion to answer that email. Most people know that, and they said, I don't see how you can respond so fast. But in digital media, if you look at all of the bad things that have happened, mm -hmm. it's because, <coughs> I hate to use this term, but somebody was really stupid. They didn't step back, it, even though there's so many more venues and avenues now that, from my perspective and trying to protect our company, I always tell her, slow down. <laughs> Don't move too fast because there are a lot of inferences can be made if you're not careful in how you deploy and employ mm -hmm. digital media. Um, ours is really being more today than it ever has been built around our brand and making sure that digital media does the right things to show that we're, you know, we're a secure place for people to go to. We have high business integrity, those sorts of things. And it's, I always have said in, in a lot of things in business, if moving too fast, can get you in more trouble than moving too slow. Not always the case, but and that's the way we've looked at digital media, because we, again, you have to be engaged in it. You have to be internally engaged, and we use Yammer and, uh, and other forms of communications to make sure, I have people stretched over seven states, 10 cities, and they need to collaborate. And you can really use digital media tools, platforms, in a collaborative fashion that can really get you a, a lot of results. For example, we had engineers that were trying to architect solutions across the footprint, and I asked them how they were doing it one day, and they said, well, we're using IM, and then we're using SharePoint, and I said, wait a minute, that's you got two different processes going on here. <clears throat> and so that's when we, we had Yammer came up, which was license-free at that point in time. What I wanted them to do was create an environment where they could retrieve, create directories of information, because what, I'm dragging you on into way in the details, but <laughs> when, I, when we architect a customer solution, and almost every customer I have has to have a specific design. It's not, it's not sold over the internet, it's actually architected. We have to have a depository or a, a directory of that information because it is repeatable in right, some respects. Right. But they were losing that because they were so intent on using social media to communicate, they weren't creating an audit trail that they could retrieve the information. Right. And so we've gone, that's an, just an example, gone yeah. that route to do so that. I, so I, I think that, that um, people get in trouble when they ignore the potential impact of digital media on their business. That's one way to get in trouble. Yeah. The other way to get in trouble is when they think that they have to architect the solution themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, w I would bet that you've met some new people um, in, as you've adapted the technology to your business. So I think it's a, it's a process of, of adaption, um, uh, adaptation, I should say.